just look up. Comets and Eos. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion for Just Look Up, Comets and the Earth. Now, the film Don't Look Up recently captured the eyes of the general public, bringing the story of a massive comet heading toward Earth to screens everywhere. Perhaps less well known is the recent discovery of a similar real life comet currently racing toward its closest approach to the sun. Now we're going to talk with Pedro Bernardinelli, co-discoverer of Comet Bernardinelli Bernstein, a comet the size of Mount Everest. We're going to discuss the film Don't Look Up, science in the media, and how making a real-life discovery of a massive comet compares with Hollywood's vision of science. Ancient people hotly debated the nature of comets. Usually these visitors from the outer solar system were considered to be portents of doom. doom. In the Iliad, Homer describes a comet bringing disease, pestilence, and war. In 1456, Pope Calliastus III excommunicated Comet Haley, ordering it never to return. For some strange reason, the comet stubbornly continued to reappear every 76 years or so, despite the admonitions of the Catholic Church. Comets can often appear out of nowhere and disappear, never to be seen again. Being fairly rare events, comets appearing in the skies of Earth have always provoked a sense of wonder. Uh, for most of human history, comets were thought by most people to be atmospheric phenomena, taking place somewhere just beyond the clouds. In the late 16th century, astronomer Tycho Brahe studied the parallax of a comet in 1577, Finding these bodies are found far beyond the orbit of the moon. Inspired by the great comets of 1680 and 1682, Edmund Halley began his, his studies of comets, needing to bring in a heavy hitter in the math to the discussions. Halley talked to his personal friend, Isaac Newton, in a statement that must have flipped Haley's powdered wig, Newton replied that he already completed those equations years before and lost the notes. Sorry, Edmund. Haley convinced Newton to rework his equations, which Haley later then published. Haley, and you knew this was coming around, noticed the comets of 1531, 1607, and 1682 appeared similar, appearing every 75 years or so. He proposed that these three comets were just a single body that now bears his name, Comet Haley. A new film, Don't Look Up, tells the story of the aftermath that follows the discovery of a mountain-sized comet racing towards an apocalyptic collision course with Earth. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Recently, a real-life comet the size of Mount Everest was found heading toward its closest approach to the sun. Fortunately, Comet Bernardinelli Bernstein, one of the largest comets ever found, is not headed toward an impact with the Earth. 
we talk with co-discoverer astronomer Pedro Bernardinelli. This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we're happy to be joined once again by Pedro Bernardinelli. He is a doctoral student at the University of Washington, and he recently helped find the largest, if one of the largest, if not the largest comet uh, yet seen. Welcome back to the show, Pedro. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here once again. Yeah, thanks. And so, um, you know, as you briefly mentioned, you uh, you have, you're one of the co-discoverers of comet Bernardinelli Bernstein, um, and uh, it's one of certainly one of the largest comets yet found, if not the largest. And coincidentally, it's also headed somewhat towards. The middle of the solar system. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, now, now I don't know if you know this or not, but there's recently been a movie about this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, there may have been some talk in the media. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm assuming you saw the movie, and what, what were your general, quick general thoughts on it? Yeah, I did get to to see the movie, and uh, it was a. Uh, a very funny coincidence, you know, I discovered this comet last year and then this movie comes out that has a very similar theme. So it was, it was kind of hilarious. My in-laws were visiting from Brazil when we watched the movie and uh, all of us did get to laugh about it and make some jokes. And obviously lots of uh, folks from uh, UPenn, where it was before moving to uh, University of Washington, uh, sent both me and my advisor their messages saying, hey, so we saw this movie and looks like you're DiCaprio and Pedro is <laughs> Jennifer Lawrence in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how do you feel to be like, you know, to be bumped by you know, Leonardo <laughs> DiCaprio and Jennifer Lawrence. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I have to say that uh, Jennifer Lawrence did a really good job of portraying a grad student. <laughs> <laughs> I thought she did a great job. <laughs> Whoever was her science advisor really, really did a good job there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. And um, so, you know, when you and, you know, Last year, you and Gary Bernstein, you know, uh, dis discovered evidence for this for this real world comet in data uh, from 2014. Now, how did uh, that? How did your discovery of that comet and your early plotting of where this thing was going compare to what happened in the film? So, one thing that I thought was really interesting in uh, in the movie was that they discovered a comet as part of a search for distant supernovae or something like that. Yeah. It was something related to cosmology, which happens to be exactly the same uh, thing with how we found this comet. Uh, we found it in data of the Dark Energy Survey, which is a project aimed at measuring galaxies and all that stuff to study cosmology. So that was a very funny coincidence. And, uh, uh, a very there, there's this perfect parallel to real world, right? This sorts of things happen. It's not just in the movie. Uh, one thing that I thought the movie did pretty well, uh, and also was pretty bad at the movie at the same time, was that uh, once they have the data for this comet, they have like a four hour uh, observation arc or something. They go ahead and they use first principles to figure out the orbit of the object. I think. Figuring from first principles was beautiful and one of my favorite parts of the movie, actually. Yeah, yeah. Because this is something that, uh, you know, everyone that does source system science should do when they, in their lives, is try to solve these orbits the way they did it in uh, the 1800s or whatever. Uh, they even mentioned Gauss method, which was a method developed exactly for studying the orbits of, of these things. On the other hand, with a four-hour orbital arc, they never would be able to... <laughs> Uh, get a precision that they do get in the in the movie. Right. If, if I'm not mistaken, they say something like, "Oh, it's gonna be like 100 kilometers from the coast of Chile or something like that." Uh, they would never do that for four hour arc. That's right, yeah. impossible. In, in, in one uh, month, we have, four days, six hours, twelve yeah. minutes, and twenty two seconds. Right. Yeah. 
Exactly. With four hours of data, they can't do that. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, to get those sorts of precision, you need years and years of data of the object. Uh, Plus, you know, uh, if you're if you're doing uh, studies of something that is going to get really close to Earth, then uh, the first principle approach, where you're just using the sun and etc., doesn't work anymore. You have to start caring about what happens if you include the other planets in the picture. So, while hmm. it was a very nice portrayal of how the process of science goes, it's obviously a simplification of how we actually do these things in in real life. And. Um... Can tell us for those who may not remember um, or you know known, but what is? Um, can you give us a brief intro to your comet? What is what is that thing like? What is, what is it doing? Yeah, so we discovered this thing in data from 2014 to 2018. Uh, we were conducting a search for transient thin objects. Uh, these are some of the most distant bodies in the solar system, and we study these things because understanding them is a good way of understanding how the solar system has formed. And somewhat by luck, we ran into this comet. It was at a distance slightly below what we were expecting to find things in, so uh, we we were not expecting to get something like that, uh, is a good way of saying this. And um, we got this object when it was a distance of like 29 AU, so that is almost the distance between uh, the Sun and Neptune. So that is a very, very distant comet, which is somewhat unique in its, in its own right. And this object is also really big. It has a diameter of about 150 kilometers. That's what we've been able to estimate. This has some uncertainty associated to it because we don't know uh, what is the proper albedo for the surface. So in other words, we don't know how reflectant, reflective sorry, the surface is. But that's part of life. It's hard to measure the things anyway. Um, and uh, this thing has a perihelion, so the closest uh, distance that we get to the sun of 11 U that we will be reached in 2031. So we have still have almost 10 years to study this thing before it reaches uh, perihelion. And yeah, as I said, it was found in a cosmology data set. So, you know, those things happen in real life. <laughs> All right. And... Um... And, but it's never going to come even as close as Saturn. Yeah, the, so this 11 AU is slightly beyond uh, the orbit of Saturn. Uh, it's funny uh, because there was a lot of uh, coverage about this comet in Brazilian media because I'm Brazilian. And uh, lots of people asked me that question. And I even came up with a joke that I am really proud of. Uh, <laughs> oh, tell say, Yeah, saying <laughs> that this thing is... Uh, Coming towards the Earth is technically right because it is, but it's also the same as saying that every time I get my paycheck, my uh, fortune gets closer to uh, Jeff Bezos. It is technically right. It doesn't mean that I reach that. <laughs> right, and, and there's, so, there's, so there's no reason to, uh, you know, somehow bring a space shuttle out of, yeah. out of yeah. retirement and launch it along with twenty <laughs> other rockets. Yeah, all exactly. At the same time to get to this thing, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and, and as you mentioned, you, you you first found that comet looking at old at old data, and there's a lot of telescopes that have been producing a lot of data for a long time. What 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 attracted you to that that particular frame, that particular set of data <clears throat> to look at? Yeah, so my PhD advisors they are part of the ES collaboration, and so am I, and um, we wanted to do something with this data. We knew that we had the possibility of finding these sorts of objects in there. The problem was figuring out how to do that. That was the main thing that I did during my PhD was figuring out how to track those objects in, in our data set. And the idea here is since this is a very high quality data set, uh, we might as well try to do everything we can uh, with it. So. Inside the DS collaboration, we have projects that not only study galaxies, but also stars in the Milky Way. We have the solar system stuff and all sorts of other uh, projects that use this data. And, you know, one thing that I like to say is that we have just one sky. So <clears throat> whenever you take an image of a galaxy, you're also taking an image of everything between you and it and farther. So as long as you have a way of finding these things in your data, you can uh, you can do some science with it, even though it was not the main purpose of of this data set. Uh, to find uh, transitory objects and other sources of objects in a data set like DS is a very computationally challenging 
uh, task. And that is one thing that I always uh, was always interested about how to use computer science to tackle problems in physics and astronomy. So it was a very natural fit, not just the science part, but the, the actual technical aspect of, of the project was something that I was interested in uh, from the beginning. Yeah. And so can, I'm just curious, you know, seeing, you know, a few movies, of course, you know, Don't Look Up is one and Contact also comes to mind where, you know, huge discoveries are made by astronomers and it is in the powers that be, you know, try to, you know, clamp down on, on, on that info getting out and, you know, somehow it still manages to leak out, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm curious, you know, how, how you would see, you know, if there, you know, if your comet, let's say, had been a near Earth, turned out to be a near Earth object, even, you know, how, how how do you see that sort of news being being spread about, being that being event being played out? Yeah, one thing that I uh, really liked that they did in the movie was that they turned to social media when it was clear that. Uh, the powers that be, as I said, wouldn't care too much about it. And, you know, in modern times, I think that that's what any astronomer would do. Uh, if, if they found something insane that they had to get out there, they would just post on Twitter or et cetera, and all of the community would get behind it quite quickly. Uh, I saw from when we announced the discovery of this comet how fast this news spread among the common community, and this was something that I was not expecting to happen. Uh, and, you know, if it's one interesting object that a lot of people will get to study uh, about spread, there's a, an object like that spread so fast, imagine if something's actually threatening, like, a, as I say, a near, near Earth object or some uh, asteroid that will definitely uh, hit the Earth. So, you know, in modern times, I think it's very hard to hide the sorts of information, uh, especially because astronomers like to talk to each other. And... You know, every time there's a new discovery, you end up getting a leak from someone that heard about it before you did, and they just send me a message or stuff like that. Find it's on a mailing list somewhere. Yeah, exactly. Eventually, someone will, we find out about it and spread the news. Uh, that, that's part of life. Life we like to gossip. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't <it> wonderful. <laughs> and can you give uh, as we get closer to wrapping up here? Can you give us a look at the future of combat hunting? Oh. Yeah, we're we're in a point where uh, the Vera Rubin Observatory is uh, starting to enter its final stages of production. There's a the camera, finishing the telescope, and etc. And in something like two years, this project will start taking data. And uh, the idea of this project is to essentially map out uh, the southern hemisphere of the sky and try to find as many sources and things as they can. And this is, on the one, on the one hand, it will make amateurs discovering comets a uh, much harder business because they're going to find simply everything uh, that is there to be found in the southern hemisphere. On the other hand, uh, I was seeing some estimates uh, recently, and they expect to find something like 10,000 comets or something like that. And nowadays, we know of like 4,000 or Mm -hmm. uh, that's the right order of magnitude. I'm not sure if it's like 1,000 or 5,000, yeah, 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 but it's yeah. something like that. Yeah, yeah. So we'll have a lot more objects to <clears throat> to study. And this is great, right? Because not only uh, they're going to map the whole sky, oh, sorry, half the sky, they'll do this for 10 years. So it's going to be the best data set for uh, solar system science in uh, probably ever. Uh, you know, if you gave an astronomer an infinite amount of money what they, to study the solar system, what they would build would probably, probably be the Vera Rubin Observatory. So it's a, it's a great time to be in the field. <clears throat> great. And finally, what's, what's next for you? Uh, yeah, so I just started my time here at University of Washington, uh, and I'm joining a few other projects to find more objects. So one of the projects that I've recently joined is exactly the Vera Rubin Observatory. Uh, there are a few other surveys dedicated to finding TNOs that I'm starting to, to work on. And <clears throat> yeah, uh, hopefully find a lot more of these objects in, in the future and get to learn a lot more about the sources and from them. 
That's fabulous, and I'm sure you will. <laughs> well, thanks again, Pedro. It was, it was great talking with you once more. It was great, yeah. And Thank you. that was Pedro Bernardinelli, doctoral student at the University of Washington. These dirty snowballs orbit the sun, traveling around their orbits over time spans ranging from a few decades to tens of thousands of years. Now, really great comets appear a few times a century. The most recent of these were the twin appearances of comet Yakutake during the opening months of 1996 and Hale Bop the following year. Now, Hale Bop shone in the night sky for a record breaking 18 months, more than doubling the record set by the Great Comet of 1811. In the early 1950s, a pair of hypotheses attempted to explain the nature of comets. The first idea, the Sandbank model, suggested comets were a loose amalgamation of ice and dust. The competing dirty snowball model eventually won out following missions to explore Comet Haley in 1986. Uh, astronomers finally figured out the makeup of comets, largely water, carbon dioxide, dioxide, methane, and ammonia. Many of these bodies remain unchanged since the earliest days of our solar system, providing astronomers a pristine glimpse into the formation of our family of planets. Billions of years ago, Earth was subject to frequent bombardment by comets, and these collisions may have delivered much of the water we find on our world today, as well as critical molecules essential for the development of life. We currently understand that comets form from the same cloud of gas and dust which make up our local planets and moons. An idea first put forward by Emmanuel Kant in 1755 and Pierre Simon Laplace 50 years later. However, Laplace, unable to understand the odd orbits of comets, suggested they came from outside the solar system. This idea held sway until the middle of the 20th century, when astronomers began to understand how Earth moves through our galaxy. In 1950, astronomer Johannes Oort uh, first suggested the existence of a massive swarm of dormant comets lying far beyond the orbit of Pluto. Icy bodies within this Oort cloud can be perturbed by collisions or the passing of a nearby star, driving new comets racing toward the sun. Biela's comet disintegrated during a close pass to the sun in 1852. However, two decades later, when the comet normally would have returned, Earth experienced a massive display of shooting stars. This provided evidence for the idea that meteor showers, at least most of them, are the result of Earth encountering debris left behind by a passing comet. The next time you see a shooting star race across the sky, remember the debris at the center of the display may have traveled over thousands of years from the edge of the solar system only to flash before your eyes for a small fraction of a second. On the next episode of The Cosmic Companion, we will celebrate women in science. We will talk with Claire Fiesler and Gabby Salazar from National Geographic, as well as Kim Masharia of Space Prize promoting young women in science. Make sure to join us on the 1st of March, as we kick off Women's History Month at the Cosmic Companion. See you then. Visit us anytime at thecosmiccompanion.net or out there on social media. We'd love to see you. 
Here's every, wishing everyone clear skies.